Planning to protect our resources from disaster has never been more vital. In this program, we're going to talk with experts in disaster planning for museums and historic properties. And we're going to show step by step how to develop a disaster plan. We'll look at the process of making a plan and who needs to be involved. And we'll go into the individual elements of the plan. We'll explore the steps you can take to head off disasters before they happen and to mitigate damages from events that are unavoidable. Finally, we'll spend some time looking at what to do after disaster strikes, the immediate response, and then the recovery of historic artifacts. For this part, we'll make use of a training exercise conducted by the National Park Service. The first thing about disaster planning is to think of it as a comprehensive process that requires you to look at your entire property from the front gate to the most valued artifact to the fuse box in the basement with fresh eyes. And it asks you to take a similarly fresh look at all the people who work at your institution. For a comprehensive look at the planning process, we talked with an expert on disaster planning for historic properties, Arthur Dutille. Arthur served as Superintendent of Buildings and Grounds at Chesterwood, a National Trust for Historic Preservation site for 22 years. And today, he's the Facilities Manager at Congregation of Marians in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. We also spoke with one of Arthur's colleagues in the public sector, Chief Richard Wilcox, Chief of Police in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. We asked Arthur what goes into a good disaster plan and how the whole process starts. It really starts internally with the desire and the need to do it, uh, to share knowledge amongst your staff, uh, the mechanical people, to the curators, the archivists, the library, and the director in finance. They all have, play an important part to the institution. And at any time, any one of them may be called upon to take the role of somebody who is missing or absent on vacation. And so the first phase of a disaster plan is really communications. What do I know about my institution that I want you to know? And what do you need in your office to share with me so I can serve in your absence? But likewise, a disaster plan gives us the opportunity under cool minds, clear thinking, and sitting around the table to share a plan and see how it works with each other. Many times in small institutions, uh, even larger ones, if you isolate yourself, your knowledge, your dedication uh, of that, your function in that institution is not passed on. And then as that plan is being developed, uh, it has to, others have to be brought into it. Uh, those of uh, outside services that would be responding to your museum so that they're familiar with it. I think critical to, to dealing with the different facilities, the museums and, and cultural institutions in the town of Stockbridge has been um, the ability to establish and maintain a relationship um, with the people who manage those institutions. Um, it's so critical um, in a time of crisis to know who people are and what their function is, what their job is. Um, simple things like um, um, property maps, uh, floor plans, structural plans, even the makeup of, of the staff and their roles. We have, a, we have a file, or we maintain a notebook on each institution and we have to update it frequently. It's really important from the beginning to have top level support for planning and to involve all departments and all levels in the process. At the outset, gather literature about emergency preparedness. Look at plans developed by sister institutions. Talk to local insurance companies and see if they might have a model plan. With this background, take a fresh look at your own institution. To develop a successful plan, uh, you have to think outside of the box, but you also have to look at your total facility with a new eye, uh, a trained eye. Um, too often we know the visitor is coming to see a particular piece or a particular collection in your museum and that may be your highest priority uh, in historic value or in monetary value. However, you have to look outside of that room or that collection. 
So starting right at the front entrance to your property, start to look at what are the risks. And I like to even uh, take your mind a little further than that in this day and age. Uh, if you've got a railroad track in the neighborhood or a major highway, we realize that there's uh, chemicals being transported. The risk may not be at your site, but you may be asked to vacate your site because of a neighborhood risk. Uh, how are you going to go through a, a rapid, orderly shutdown for the protection of the visitor as well as your staff and equally as well as your collections? So start by taking a comprehensive look at your building and your collections and think about them in the context of their overall environment. Now what specifically goes into a disaster plan? What goes into a good disaster plan is first uh, documentation. Uh, document your site and we know curators document the, their artifacts and that but now you've got to document your facilities, that being your structure, uh, your services, public utility services coming in. You want to know much, as much about your site as possible and this is why it's really a total staff effort. It's not one person. It involves all the staff because they bring strengths and knowledge to the uh, disaster plan. Followed by documentation, you want to communicate that. You want to put it in some format. You want to share this information about where utilities are. You want to share information about risk. What are some of the risks that you're living with as an institution, as a museum? Of course, disaster planning isn't just about your building and your collection and your people. As you go through the process, you'll realize that in the event of a disaster, there's a lot of outside support you can draw on. A good disaster plan has, um, has to be very comprehensive, and the more people you can get involved in creating that plan, uh, the better the plan's going to be. You may already have established a network of people who can help both with drawing up your plan and critiquing drafts as you move ahead. First and foremost, maybe your insurance company. Uh, they have trained professionals. They have gone through many incidences with other uh, historic houses or sites, so they can uh, bring that knowledge to the table. Um, outside government agencies, not only we spoke about your local emergency services, but your county and your state agencies have already done disaster plans and risk management. Um, they're also willing to come in most cases and uh, not only critique your plan, but to share other uh, knowledge with you. Uh, other institutions, either in your immediate area or from across the country that have done disaster plans, uh, will be willing to critique your plan and show you its strengths and its weaknesses. Your local fire and police departments are important allies, and you'll want to work closely with them from the beginning. Dwight D. Eisenhower said, uh, the plan is nothing, planning is everything. And the implication there, of course, is that um, it's most important for us all to be together um, and to be involved in the planning. Naturally, you're also going to circulate your plan within your organization. Make sure everyone has a chance to look at it, think about it, and make comments then incorporate their suggestions and once again circulate the revised plan. Now this may sound like a never-ending process and you're right. Your plan should never be thought of as finished. It will always be a work in progress representing the best information and the best thinking at your organization at the moment. But always being changed and updated because your situation will always be changing.